Hello everybody! Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show episode number 114 with me, your host Agostino. This is actually 114. Yesterday or last week's episode was 113, but I said 114 by accident. So in case you listen to this and you think, you know, shit, I played the same thing twice. No, you didn't. Chill out, all right? Chill out. You didn't play the same thing twice. This is actually 114. Last week was 113, but I fucked up the numbers and stuff. But this is definitely 114. Welcome back, one and all. How are you doing? How's it going? Are you fine, well hydrated, well rested, and well lubricated in some respects? I don't want to know where that lubrication has been applied, but I'm just asking if you have lubricated the necessary parts of your body. Great. Good to know. I am well. Uh, thanks for asking. I'm doing pretty fine. I've had a very eventful weekend, an eventful past week, I'd say, for the most part. As some of you are aware, I had um, the pleasure of signing off my life or quote unquote or aka my next contract for my new job that I'm starting very, very soon. So I'm eager to get that challenge started and ready to go um, because I want to be an A-star employee and because I want to gain as much value as I can uh, from this new um, position that I'm going to have. I've decided to buy loads of books around the subject or around the role that I'm going to be doing. There's no point in getting into the role I'm doing because, you know, it's a bit gay talking about stuff that you do in terms of work-wise. I think um, it does the things that you should maybe keep private in some respects. But just to kind of reveal a little bit of my uh, process, I do, when I tend to go into, when I go into new roles, especially roles that are a little bit um, outside of my skill set or outside of my um, day-to-day interest, I tend to buy books in and around that subject just to kind of get myself acquainted with it. I tend to think about things in and around that area. And then what I like to do, because I think it's a very good way to tackle really high level problems, is to make connections with the other industries. So I'll look at the industry that I'm working in and I'll try and make connections with um, another industry that might be doing something really cool and interesting that could apply to stuff that I'm doing. For instance, when I was working back in the day at Mastered and we were trying to figure out ways of engaging online and online community base uh, when it came to when it came to uh, providing online education, I was looking at loads of different approaches that people were applying in a personal um, um, what you call it. In the personal training field, like online personal training, that was really big when I started at Master. It kind of was exploding online, right? Uh, PTs who were selling ebooks, PTs who were doing online consultations via Skype or FaceTime, whatever it may be. Uh, PTs who are running whole classes via online platforms and kind of giving them weekly workouts or planning out their dietary needs. I got loads of inspiration from that kind of um, side of things of like, okay, how would you how would you manage? Um, an online community how would you best give them value how was the how's what's the way that you kind of like um showcase the material that you have loads of all these different things so i think that's very very important thing to do to kind of look at your domain of interest uh try and read books in and around that subject and then also try and look at other industries i might have some parallels i might have some connections that you can easily apply into the things that you're doing it's very hard. It's very difficult. It does require a lot of time, but I think the rewards and the fr- uh, the rewards and the kind of results from it are things that you would never glean if you just like stuck to just trying to understand how to be a better teacher. If you want to understand how to be a better teacher, you have to look at teachers in other industries. You have to look at teaching in its fundamental sense, like what is teaching. You have to look at people that do teaching through not even talking to students. You have to look at people that do teaching in different languages. People that do teaching in other industries. People that teach um, their sub people that teach from um, the high executive level every different view of it especially outside of the educational system will make you a better teacher overall that is my thinking again i could be wrong i could be completely missing the mark but that's something that i like to do overall so that's what i've been trying to do this past week i've also been running a lot um, as i'm sure most of you are aware i'm doing sober october which has been a flipping amazing journey to do um as i mentioned last week it goes without saying, right? It's very, very underrated waking up uh, not not hungover. And um, again, I've been, I love it. I really enjoy it. And I hope I can continue because I remember a few weeks, no, maybe a few months ago, my kind of uh, routine for drinking overall anyway was I, I kept it to the weekends, right? I didn't necessarily have any alcohol in my house, which has been a, a constant, which is kind of um, the residue effects of growing up in a very conservative Christian household, right? So I, I tended, I think I maybe had my first drink between the age of 19 and 21, right? Which is quite late for a British person. Most British people, especially m- m- especially if they live outside of a big city, right? Because you're bored, you have nothing to do. 
um, you tend to drink a lot, a lot earlier in life. And sometimes even if you live in a big city, you tend to drink quite early in life just because, you know, you're naughty, you hang around stuff, you hang around guys and girls who might have different level of permission than you do. And you want to be cool. You want to be part of the group. So you then just start drinking just because of that. And again, it's not peer pressure, but you just want to, you know, sample the fruits that everyone else is sampling because you just want to be included in the conversation. So that can happen. But sometimes if you grow up in a conservative Christian household like I did, we never had a bar, right? My dad never had um, a cocktail bar in his house, but a lot of my friends did. When I went to my friend's house to play computer game or to like hang out, you'd always go in the living room and there'd be like um, the dad's bar in the corner where he'd have his liquor and all these drinks and shit. And sometimes if the parents had gone out, they'd invite you around and we'd take like tiny, tiny amounts from each bottle so that dad didn't recognize, right? I didn't realize what we were taking and would kind of like sneak that out and stuff. So that was what kind of happened. But because I grew up in a family where we didn't have a bar in our house, no alcohol was permitted in the, in the establishment for, for the most part, I couldn't come back home hungover or drunk. My mom would get angry. So it kind of limited my um, access to alcohol. So I kind of had to stick to just, I don't know, drinking if I went on a really long school trip that allowed me to be away from home for a week or whatever, or like a sixth form trip or whatever, maybe, or outside of university, or if I decided to sleep over someone's house, I could drink or something, right? So then effectively when I did, when I was able to move into my own place, um, I was fortunate enough to kind of carry on that kind of habit um, just because it was a habit that I picked up, not because I was consciously doing it, which then, which then kind of saved me in a bit because, you know, I do tend to have a personality that goes, oh, that I'm, I'm a kind of all in person anyway when it comes out, when it goes to anything. So when I get into something, I get into it hard. So when I got into kind of like going out in nightlife culture, I went into it like, you know, we both... We, with both feet, right? I went into it hard. Like, there were only like scissor tackle, you know, like 240 challenge. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't pulling out of that shit at all. So I went into it hard, but luckily, I went into it hard, but I went into it hard more so under the guise of meeting new people, of understanding, of kind of trying to get a deep understanding of electronic music and the scene be around it. Um, I went into it hard trying to be a promoter. I went into it hard trying to get into DJing. I went into it hard trying to be like a, a scene person, a face around the way, right? I didn't go into it hard trying to be a druggy, alcoholic rock star. That wasn't my premise which is which is what kind of saved me in that regard so then when i did have some fuck ups or some mishaps that involved alcohol that involved drugs i was able to kind of pull myself away quite easily because they didn't have that much of a grip on me what is actually like i said what's actually what's my main interest in going out why i love going out why i love nightlife is meeting new people is going to cool and interesting bars and clubs is connecting with people that are running the scene, the movers and shakers of whatever um, underground label or whatever underground showcase that I'm going to. That's what I like. The alcohol and the drugs part is a good kind of like add-on, is a good kind of enab enabler to kind of like allow you to kind of get out of your shell and to be more relaxed and to kind of connect to people in a deeper way or blah, 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 blah. But the main part of it is the meeting of the people and uh, being in that common space around people is amazing, right? Sharing that same shared interest is fucking great. It's something beautiful about that. But the one thing that has kind of got out, of, got a bit, you know, a little bit out of control has been the drinking during the week because, you know, I've got disposable income now. I earn good money. Um, I DJ a lot as well during the weekends. So what that ends up doing is that you end up drinking a lot more than you'd actually intend to drink just to kind of get through the week, quote unquote. And again, like alcohol is so cheap, man. It's so cheap, especially around my way. We've got Tesco Express around here. We've got Morrison's that's always doing crazy deals on alcohol and liquor and stuff. So there's always a temptation to go out, especially when you're in a shop off license and oh, I'm sorry, when you're in a supermarket, you want to buy like a box of six beers and then there's a box of 10 or 12 next to you that is only like two pound more than the box of six or so automatically you're like, you know what, let me just buy the 10 so I have 10 and I can have some left over for another time. But what inevitably ends up happening is that you end up drinking a whole 10 anyway in a very short period of time, maybe over a weekend, maybe over a course of a night if you're going on crazy, going really, really, really crazy, which again ends up affecting your health and ends up kind of like, it ends up taking away all the benefits of me working out. So I might be working out at the same level, but if I'm drinking that often, like four, day, four days in a week, for instance, if I'm drinking from Thursday to Sunday, I'm, I'm kind of negating the benefits or the rewards or the positives that comes from working out or comes from having a balanced diet. And then, anyway, if you drink too much anyway, a balanced diet won't even work in that respect. So I've gone a bit off the rails and this October October's allowed me to come back on the rails. And now I'm, I'm hoping that going forward or my goal, my mission is that to keep this kind of um, way of living 
um, keep this kind of level of maintaining uh, a schedule where I only drink between Mondays and Fridays and then or Monday to let's say Sunday to Thursday and then from Friday to Saturday that's when I can kind of go crazy and have my fun time but I need to have the majority of my week spent non hungover and especially when it comes to DJing like I've realized like I think I think um, I heard a few comedians mention it because I get a lot of power again main connections with industries are not your own I get a lot of lessons I get a lot of um, gems and a lot of great insights and ideas on work ethic and ideas on how to network and ideas on how to manage your career and ideas on how to kind of think about where you're going to go from stand-up comedians right it's something I'll end up inevitably doing anyway I think I'll end up kind of going in that lane regardless but I think for the low level that I'm doing in terms of DJing like the kind of amateurish kind of semi-independent level that I'm doing um, intermediate level sorry that I'm doing in terms of DJing I get a lot of lessons from that side of things I think I remember hearing a Joe Rogan or someone along that lines I'm um, saying on a podcast that sometimes you actually have a cigarette like a nick like a, just a cigarette just for the nicotine right and then when I went to Berlin recently I bought like a pack of cigarettes and had like a long pour on a cigarette and again, because I'm, I'm not a smoker, that nicotine heat, that nicotine hit really went to my head. I was like, whoa, tripping a little bit. You know? I mean, like a little bit tingly feeling. Like, okay, I get why people smoke. But then after smoking four or five or six, the the effect kind of like diminishes, right? It kind of takes a bit of a nosedive. So then it got me thinking, it kind of relates to alcohol in the same respects, right? We all kind of chase this high, this alcoholic high that we first get after the first kind of couple of cocktails or first kind of couple of... Um, swigs of whiskey or a couple pints of beer but then afterwards we're tra- we're effectively chasing a dragon that doesn't exist right we're effectively chasing this dragon that we're never going to be able to get again and unfortunately british drinking culture which is not the same as mediterranean because i've been i think i've said it a, a few times but the the problem that we have in british drink culture is that we always go to excess we don't we don't necessarily mediate now again there's some people out there who argue and say okay i guess you know i actually mediate i actually can temper myself really well i can have a couple of pints and go home cool congratulations but i think for the most part for me personally i can't do that when i go out and have one it ends up having two or three right but i've said i was going to have one and i can't necessarily just have the one and sometimes the one is good enough that one after a long hard day's work and you just want to have a nice refreshing beer the taste of it on your tongue, the effects of it as you're kind of like sipping this pint really slowly and you're getting a little bit tipsy and you're making jokes with your friends. That's cool, but you don't necessarily need to go for two or three. Even the second one, you could probably have a half pint, it'll be fine, but you always have to get the, the full pint because you want to get more value for money. It's just a ridiculous kind of way to kind of go about things. So that it kind of hampers us overall. And you then don't tend to enjoy what you're having anymore. But I do remember Joe Rogan saying something along the lines of like sometimes you actually have a drink on stage or have a little shot before he goes up and does a stand-up routine because it helps to kind of loosen him up a little bit right to kind of get him into um to kind of get him into state right a lot of pickup artists if you see them online because i used to be part of that pickup uh, pick up artist community you know um i'm not ashamed of it i think it was a really important time in my life when i was kind of suffering from a crisis of confidence i didn't really have anything to offer right attractive women in that respect right i was, I was severely overweight um, I was working a pretty shitty job. I was living at home. So there's loads of things that weren't really making me an attractive mate in some respects. So I had to add something to my bow. I had to add some strings to my bow that allowed me to be more attractive. And g- going into the pickup community, uh, the pickup artist community allowed me to kind of understand my self-worth. But also let me understand like what attraction actually is, right? And one thing about the pickup community, or what was, it, what was this lent to what I was talking about in terms of stand-ups? Yeah, my train of thought has gone all the way off. I don't know what I was talking about here again. What you're going to speak about? So anyway, I think, oh yeah, to get in, to get into state. There we go. I remember to get into state. So in a pickup uh, um, artist community, getting into state, they equate that, um, they used to equate, they used to equate getting into state as in like, you know, if you're going to go, imagine you're going to go out, imagine you intended, like this, so some people might sound crazy, but imagine you intended to go out to Piccadilly Circus to go and talk to, um, attractive women and try and like seduce them right try and get them interested in you so you can get their numbers get their details and maybe arrange a date sometime or if you can if you're possible arrange some some somehow get a same date a same day date at that occasion that you're meeting them if you're not drinking you're gonna have to allow yourself to, you're gonna you're gonna have to allow yourself you're gonna have to give yourself the room to fail the first five or ten approaches that you do right the first five or ten girls you speak to you're gonna have to allow yourself to fail why because you're leaving your house at, let's say, 9 p.m. to go to Piccadilly Circus. Everyone that you meet at Piccadilly Circus is probably um, already raging. They've already got a couple of drinks in them. They might have some drugs in them too. And you've come out of the house completely stone cold sober. And you're going 
um, under the premise of going to try and speak to strangers that you don't know, which obviously brings its own level of pressure. So in order to kind of ease that pressure, you're going to have to allow yourself to fail a few times and then you're going to get yourself acclimatized to where you are and you're going to feel nice and relaxed and going to be able to flow a bit better. And then after the 10th maybe approach, you might start getting some success. You might get girls stopping, right? Because the first five or 10, you might, they might not even stop. They might not even acknowledge your presence. You might get a few stops. You might get a few highs. You might get a few pleasantries exchanged. You might get a few exchanges of actual real names, not fake names. And then look, so, by and large, little by little, as you get more and more into this quote-unquote state, it allows yourself to be more comfortable and effectively you can finally approach someone and it could be concrete. Now, the same thing happens with alcohol and going out and DJing and shit, right? Or doing a stand-up routine. I remember Joe mentioning that he likes to have a couple of drinks or have a cocktail just to get himself into state so that you are what you're, you're oddly, you're oddly like... um relaying or you're kind of like emitting this wave from the stage to people that you are also in the same position that they're in right whether it's your loosey goosey whether you got a drink in you you're letting, you're letting them know that you're not kind of communicating from this level of superiority like oh, i'm not even drinking i'm just gonna be here up here on my high horse no i am one of you we are one of the same and that's what i've kind of, that's what i'm hoping happens after this sober october event or this kind of challenge is that I tend to, I stick to not drinking during the weekdays, right? I tend to kind of give give that a miss and put that on hold because, again, training during the week, Monday to Friday, I want to get the maximum benefits of it and also working, doing a podcast, um, DJing on a Friday night. And I'm, I need my brain to be clear so I can think better, right? But then I'm also going to allow myself during the weekends if I'm DJing on a Saturday or if I'm going out, I'm also going to allow myself, or if I'm DJing during the weekends, and more specifically, I'm going to allow myself to the room to maybe have a drink or two to kind of allow myself to kind of relax a little bit because that's what i've realized when i've been djing sober the relaxation period only happens when i get some um external kind of validation or approval from people right and people are like oh man that was a really good tune but blah, blah, blah. someone comes up to you it doesn't happen often even right so you're waiting for someone to tell you you're doing a good job before you get relaxed but when you have a drink or two you don't need an external um validation or approval to make you relax you'll just relax anyway so that's what really that's where the benefit i see of drinking when you're performing comes in where like you can just relax yourself you can kind of get yourself into your own state because again no matter how pick up community stuff there are there, there there is a faction i know um i think real social dynamics are the ones that kind of promote this and a few others but i know there's a there's a group called uh, real social dynamics you can check them out at um, rsdnation.com they exude they kind of um they champion the idea of when you're going out to approach women that you should be stone cold sober in general they don't really subscribe to the idea of going out drunk now some people can look at that and think it's a bit rapey because when you're going out you're then approaching girls who are under the substances or under you know are intoxicated and you're clear thinking and you can get them to do whatever you want but the idea behind it is that you should be able to do that sober so that when you're drunk you'll be an absolute animal because when you're when you're when you're drunk you're your kind of your social awareness kind of skills kind of go down but then your confidence goes up right you're able to kind of talk to more people you kind of loosen up a little bit you're not uh socially awkward as you maybe would be if you're sober but then you're but then the you know the negative of it is that your awareness goes down you're not really you don't have a good gauge when somebody doesn't want to talk to you anymore you're a bit clumsy in that respect right but they do champion the idea of going out stone cold sober and then doing it that way now i wouldn't do it in the long term i think I proved to myself that I can DJ sober. I proved to myself that I can go outside sober. I know that. I'm, I'm fully aware that I don't have a problem. I don't have a dependency. I'm not drinking or to escape my reality. Blah, 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 blah. But I do think there's a benefit, especially the places I DJ, especially if it's like a, a random warehouse party in the depths of Hackney Wick, right, or somewhere in North London or somewhere in South London. You need, a, in those spaces, if you've ever been in a warehouse party or a lot, you need, or even like a really rambunctious house party, you need a drink or two um, to kind of get yourself acclimatized to the environment. Everyone's off their tits on something and you just can't function just being stone cold sober, in my opinion, again. So that's what the kind of um, revelation I got from it. And again, it's been amazing, though. I kind of have realized I am a far better person than maybe DJ overall. Or, quite, or just to say person when I'm sober anyway, I think the best parts of my personality come out a lot more when I'm just sober as opposed to drunk. I think sometimes they can veer down. I wouldn't say confrontational, but it can get a little bit too much. I, I, I can understand that in that respect because... I think I'm too much anyway, sober. So imagine what it's like when you drink and you have drugs added to the equation. So again, I think yearly, doing this yearly, 
so sober October challenge has been is gonna be fucking amazing going forward. I think this relates a little bit to I think Seneca, the famous Stoic, used to do used to kind of preach um, the philosophy of uh, an enforced kind of poverty, right? Where you kind of live by me- meager means. You kind of wear the same clothes. You don't spend much money. You eat really simply. There was this idea that if you do that. Like again, some people might say, "Oh, you're co- you're culture appropriating poverty, or whatever bullshit it is." But it's kind of an understanding or appreciation that you can get a- you can get away with um, you can live with just the meager meager kind of amenities, right? You don't need a lot of things. It's kind of the idea of like people saying to you when you go traveling, you shouldn't take a check in bag, right? You should try and carry everything in a carry on or in a backpack. The idea behind it is that the meager means that you're taking with you is going to allow yourself to kind of really uh, surrender yourself to the holiday full pelt and not have the crux of having seven different pairs of shoes, different outfits all the time. It's like, no, I'm going to take the bare necessities with me. And then when I go to Southeast Asia, I'm then going to top up anything else I want by um, buying it out there and then leaving it when I finish with it and giving it to locals, whatever it may be. But the act of like going to Southeast Asia with only one outfit and then filling it up later as you get there allows you to kind of explore where you are a little bit more and communicate with locals and meet different people and have new fresh experiences that's the kind of idea behind it. the same sort of way to kind of enforced uh, poverty and I guess the same sort of thing would happen with kind of like um, even though you have the disposable income to buy drugs to buy alcohol um, to be gluttonous and eat out every day you don't right you kind of allow yourself not to do that every single day so that when you finally do do it you can appreciate it more and you can also allow yourself to understand that you can live without these luxuries in life you can just get away with it it's not you don't need to have them in order to kind of make life worthwhile that's the kind of um, lessons that i've kind of gleaned from it anyway that's enough of my philosophy on things that constant rambling and let's get into some topics that have been hotting up during the week hotting hotting up number one topic that i'm sure a few of you guys have very very are very very aware of or seen a lot of it kind of spoken about has been the kind of um has been the what would you say the con not our consequences the aftermath of kanye's kind of you know trump um trump activism or him trying to kind of break out of the quote-unquote matrix <coughs> And one person that's been kind of, you know, out there, which has been something that's been rare to see, has been Drake. Drake um, took part in an interview with uh, for a program called The Shop, an interview, a kind of a TV series um, held by LeBron James, where he has some of his friends hang out in a barbershop similar to, you know, most African-American or black barbershops that you'd see probably the world over. It's kind of, a, I guess most barbershops anyway have that kind of... Um, tilt to them where you kind of go in there to kind of catch up with mates and people that you know to get trim you know to talk about current events and just to kind of bro out in a kind of man environment so um uh, drake was their special guest in this episode and he kind of expounded upon and detailed the inner goings on of what led to him and Pusha t's kind of this record back and forth over daytona and over the stuff just before um scorpion came out And there's some interesting insights into this whole beef that we weren't aware of prior to Drake kind of speaking of it. I guess if you listen to the Joe Budden podcast, a lot of the theories that they were expounding upon in that podcast have been proved correct um, when you listen to the interview with Drake and the shop. So a lot of the theories that they were kind of throwing out, they have been proved right. Now, some of it might be inside baseball talk because Joe Budden and a few of the guys on the Joe Budden podcast are friendly or are called you of a lot of the OVO crew so maybe they got some insider talk but it was quite cool to see that a lot of the stuff that they were speaking about a lot of the theories they kind of threw out they were proved completely true by Drake's interview now if you're a Kanye fan a Kanye stan someone that's in a Kanye camp you're going to be a little bit upset by the interview and you're going to feel like you know Drake is lying and he's trying to disparage your guy I guess if you're a Drake fan you're going to say fuck Kanye but I think overall lessons learned from this whole debacle is that you can't of course you can't believe um one person's account of the story because you don't know what the other side of the story is but there's also a side of it which i think i relay when it comes to all of these topics concerning um people in the limelight or celebrities for that matter of fact is that i guess my thinking of it would be concentrate less on the people or the personalities behind the story right don't get that infatuated with pers- with celebrities and famous people's lives and their private matters and trying to dissect every little nook and cranny of a story and trying to figure out what's right and wrong 
concentrate on your own life in that respect, right? But what you should be gleaning from it are lessons that you can apply from your own life to your own life for that respect, right? And I think the lesson that you can apply to your own life is is to keep counsel with those nearest and dearest to you. Doesn't matter if Drake, what Drake's saying is wrong or what he's saying is a lie, whatever it may be. I think the, le the lesson to be learned from it is that you should be careful who you speak to about the private matters going on in your home. Um, especially when it comes to stuff, su something such a contentious issue as baby mother drama or baby mama drama and, you know, issues concerning your newborn child. I think you should be very, very careful who you share that news to. In the same way how, you know, if you have goals or dreams, aspirations or even job interviews, there's some people that you speak to about this kind of thing and some people that you don't in general, right? You don't tell the whole world, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You just keep your counsel in some respects, right? You have to, you have to, be, um, you have to be private in some respects and public in some respects. Just, you know, just a matter of life. And I guess if you're Drake, you're going to learn a lesson that maybe the people who you think are your friends aren't really your friends. And maybe you're going to also learn to maybe um, not be so trusting of people especially because you know in that i guess in that environment in the entertainment industry you know where you're kind of constantly having to seek approval from the public and from your peers and from labels and stuff it can be easy to kind of fall into that trap of thinking oh man this guy is looking after my best interest he's going to help me out blah, blah 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 we're going to be able to push each other forward and stuff kumbaya kumbaya but unfortunately in that world because the labels and the press and some of us listeners for some respects we are we are kind of always pitting people against each other even though we're probably in one of the best times um we're probably in one of the best eras ever in terms of music right in terms of choice in terms of access and whatever it may be we are still for some reason trying to pit some of our favorite artists against each other when for the most part most of them behind closed doors or away from the limelight they get on with each other right they're all they're around people they're around each other's houses um their group of friends kind of intermingle they attend each other's shows they support each other's merch they buy each other's albums for the most part everyone kind of gets along but even us as public even us as uh, receptive listeners we're always trying to pit our artists against each other so it's no surprise that sometimes an artist will take will see a weakness or will see a, a, an opportunity to pounce or to inflict some damage and will do it so that they can remain number one now i'm not saying that's what kanye did i'm not saying that's what drake did but that could be a, a reason behind some of the weird, snaky kind of movement some people try and do in some respects. But again, like I said, concentrating less on the people and try and get some lessons from it that you can apply in your own life. Because I don't necessarily care about the inner goings on that happens between, you know, private matters happens between Drake and Kanye. I could give two shits about it. But I think as much as this, and as much as it annoys me, um, the infatuation that people have with celebrities in general and where they try to and you know how much value or responsibility they give up to an artist or to someone they look up to i still do think that they are maybe a reflection of our society in some respects they are kind of a magnifying glass on issues that we currently have they kind of just like they do it on a public level so we're able to kind of point and criticize and make us feel better about our own lives but i think lessons should be learned from it so if you're looking at and pointing a lesson learn from it, like I, said, like I said, be careful who you trust, be careful who you impart private matters or private information to and keep your counsel to your nearest and dearest. Friends and family, they actually can trust um, a, a small group of people, right? So that rumors or whisper or gossip can't then go out of that circle. And for instance, like, you know, the, the, the Beyonce and Jay-Z stuff, like, you know, the only peak that we got into their kind of marital, mar uh, marital distress was that famous elevator incident with Solange. But apart from that, we wouldn't have known anything that was going on inside their household, right? If, if Jay-Z or Beyonce didn't speak about it on record. So most of that happens because they keep their counsel close, right? They keep all of their private matter, all their family issues to a set group of people within that circle. And if you break their trust and you're immediately out of that circle and no one else comes and takes your place, just that circle, it keeps on shrinking over time. Yes, okay, that's a, a negative, but overall you get a chance to kind of, you get an opportunity to control um where that kind of news travels at and then you get also an idea if if it does kind of leak you get an, you get um an indication of where you can go and hone in who you can speak to who you can kind of like chastise because you've only told four or five people within your group that respects it. i think that's the most um, advantageous thing of it and i think again as listeners i think the best part we have to kind of glean from this whole debacle is that um drake kind of mentioned in the interview that what happened um, that kind of issue with Pusha T it led to the records that we kind of know and love now, like um, In My Feelings and Jaded. 
um, which is fuck and not sorry and non-stop which is fucking incredible to hear right so now we know that you know for most you know you heard joe budden ranting and raving one episode about how he felt um views was uninspired and drake was bored and he wasn't making music from like a pure or real place anymore or it wasn't he wasn't feeling really motivated but you know angry drake is the best drake possible right the Duppy Freestyle was a great um, kind of like diss record. He didn't get he didn't get a chance to kind of reply back to Pusha T as he mentions in the interview because he didn't feel like going back and forth. But then in my feelings and nonstop are are great diss records in their own respect too. In that respect, right? Like they came off the back of him being angry or being a little bit, um, you know, his nose been, been bent out of shape because he felt as if like his trust or his or his thing had been violated by Kanye West, which is amazing. Again, for us fans, I think seeing somebody up against the wall is always the best possible way to kind of get great music or get contact from them. Now, again, I don't necessarily encourage you to kind of rile up your people that you look up to in order to kind of get good music from them, but it's cool to see that even the biggest artist in the world in terms of a Drake can still tap into that thing, that mode. He can tap into it. He can tap into that. He can get into that zone where if need be, if he's pushed to the edge, he can kind of like, you know, he can kind of, um, quote unquote, he can do like a, a Conor McGregor on Jose Aldo when he came rushing at him and just kind of pivot away and bang. I mean, not the person out. So that was great to see. I'll play a little clip of it from the interview now for those of you who haven't kind of watched it and you can kind of hear a little bit of Drake kind of expounding on the issues that came up when he was going back and forth with, with Pusha T and why he kind of honed in on Kanye West. You can kind of hear it now. Play it now. Towards me oh, that God. you produced, 
that's talking about writing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, and I'm writing for you. I was just there with you as friends, helping you. And now you're dissing me. So I'm like, man, this is dark. See, you know, this is dark. It made me realize. And actually, I text Braun after you guys spoke about that. Well, it about four it. days to really register what had happened. And I text Braun. I said, I hope I don't let you down with my decision. And that was something I was really concerned about. With your decision to do what, Drake? To not do anything. To not, do anything. To not, to to not respond. That's what you were worried about when you called me. Like, I'm not responding to that song. Is do you, you were just like, I don't know how people feel about that. Well, I was more concerned about, like, you know, the people who whose opinions I respect and the people we thrive off competitive nature of but there was you know people love to say like rap purists and people who just love confrontation they love to say hey man there's no rules in this shit but there are fucking rules in this shit of course and I'm gonna tell you something it's like I knew something was gonna come up about my kid they had to add like the deadbeat thing to make it more appealing which is fine and I understand that and I, even that I was like okay the mom and dad thing whatever you don't even know my family yeah. it's like some but I'm gonna tell you wishing death on my friend that has MS. I study rap battles for a living. Now, when you mention defenseless people who are sick in the hospital that passed away, that really sent me to a place where, you know, I just believed then and believe now that there's just a price that you have to pay for that. It's just, it's over. You're going to get, someone's going to fucking punch you in the fucking face. The, the, the shit's done. The event's over. I wanted to do other things. I didn't want. I didn't want to further your reputation or your career by rapping back at you and having this exchange. And and that was it for me. Drake. So that's Drake's point of view on the whole matter. And we got a kind of you know that's kind of squash in that regard. I think for the most part, I hope so. I don't want to back and forth really. Again, I'm not necessarily a big fan of rap battles anyway, especially when they go, especially when they go this deep. I think little jabs on record, especially little in, in especially little kind of inside the baseball talk stuff. You know, the kind of stuff that only a rap purist would sort of pick up or kind of really diehard fans would really acknowledge. I think that's cool. Like little back and forth. But I think whole records dedicated to dissing somebody and kind of, you know, uh, trying to from mother their name or trying to sully their name or trying to end their career, quote unquote. I don't think it's beneficial to anyone. And I think in this era nowadays where we've seen so many rappers lose their lives so recklessly, like an Exodus Tentacion, for instance, right? Who's to say all that energy, even though he was trying to change his life, who's to say all that stuff that he was doing prior, not to speak ill of the dead, kind of like had some sort of consequence to what led to the situation happened to him when he got ambushed or he kind of potentially got jacked by people and then shot in his own car, right? We're seeing rappers lose their lives over the most pettiest of things, right, that are happening nowadays. So um, Marley, Marley G, I think, from Rapper Lot Records, died the other day, right? Didn't he get shot and killed recently in a nightclub? Um, another dude, um, Yella something, got shot recently, I think 12 times in that club, he's in critical condition. A comedian on Instagram it got shot and he died of his injuries recently too. So people in rap or people in hip-hop, for instance, or in America, because, you know, they they have the right to bear arms, lose their lives over the most mundane of things. Now, if you're if you're somebody of a public, if you're somebody with a public reputation and your reputation is getting dragged throughout the, your Reputation is getting dragged in public, right? It's getting dragged through the mud and somebody's dissing you um, again and again on the record that's been played on, on the radio or whatever it may be or being played in people's cars. It, 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 can do, it can do crazy things to your mental psyche. And you can, and like Drake mentioned, you could go to places that you didn't even know you could go to and it could lead to some really dire consequences. I think for the most part, if some of the biggest artists are able to kind of pull back and recognize that, hey, maybe it might not be Drake that might pull out a gun and, and shoot somebody, but it might be someone in his crew who wants to earn favor, who wants to um, be in a good grace of Drake. He might go to that kind of extent. Then he has a responsibility to his crew. He has a responsibility to himself, to his family, to kind of step away public and say, you know what, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to go back and forth with you. I'm going to allow the universe to do whatever it needs to do. And if, you, if there are some karmic... Uh, consequences of what you do so be it if not then we're just going to move on but there has to be a level of um mutual respect when it comes to rap battles but if, it, if, there, if that doesn't exist then i think it's just a lot for the most part and i think now especially nowadays too man there's so much abundance there's so many listeners there's so many potential customers out there for you to kind of all kind of catered to that. You don't necessarily need to battle anymore in that respect. I don't think so. I think the competitive nature of hip hop existed back in the day when, you know, you need to prove that you were the number one lyricist. Nowadays, you don't need to prove that. Everyone's about the artistry and musical and the musical artistry in the purest sense of the word. There is no number one, right? Because number ones are completely subjective because everyone likes different kind of music. Now, lyrical 
prowess, uh, the ability to put words together in very interesting rhyme schemes. There is no, there is an objective one. There, there, there can be an objective number one, right? We all can kind of come to a consensus where we generally, even though they might be in different order, we can have kind of like the, we can all generally, generally have the same five people in our top five lyricists. But when it comes to top five musicians, top five artists, it's very difficult to get um, two people to have the same people in the top five. It's very, very difficult because we we're going to have different interests. So I think back in the day when there weren't that many listeners and you went to the 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 way to kind of prove that you were a good musician was to, or the good artist was to kind of be a good lyricist first. Now that that's kind of fallen by the wayside, there doesn't need to be a competitive nation hip-hop anymore. You don't need to be battling back and forth. Now, rap battles should exist still, right? URL and... Um, and all that sort of stuff, they should, they need to exist that kind of arena where people can go and flex their muscles and practice and battle people straight up bar for bar. That should exist too. But I think in the kind of pop hip hop world, people shouldn't be battling. They shouldn't be going back and forth on this track. It doesn't make any, no one cares. No one cares. You, Machine Gun Kelly isn't going to lose any fans over the Eminem record, right? Um, uh, he's not going to lose any fans. And the uh, same way Eminem, like he's not going to lose any fans to MGK. Now, are they going to gain fans? Maybe. I don't think so for the most part because you're only going to gain fans from records that they kind of hear being played in nightclubs or on radio and shit. And how often are they going to play? As good as Killshot is, how often is Killshot going to be played on the radio, right? It, it, it can only last um, for a set amount of time and then it can, it's really dated. When's the last time you heard Charged Up by Drake, right? Great record, but when's the last time you heard it? Um, it doesn't get played that often because it only exists in that little window of the time when it was relevant when him and Miko going back to back, but uh, back and forth. But outside of that, people only care about the music for the most part. So I hope, hopefully, this moves on and we can kind of progress from the situation. But it was interesting. To, it's interesting to hear Drake's POV on the whole situation overall. Anyway, moving on to the next topic on the list. Oh, um, a throwaway comment finding interesting job this is something that someone mentioned to me at work that i kind of wanted to speak about that might not have any interest to anybody else but when i kind of declared that i was going to seek pastors new and uh, seek a new adventure in another established or another corporate entity um someone made a passing comment to me in the kitchen which i thought was very interesting that kind of lended it kind of made me think about how we all have different ideas on what employment is and what kind of what purpose is serving in our lives now this person was talking to me about my new job and saying oh what are you going to be doing blah 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 i spent a little bit of what i was going to do and then he or she made a passing comment along the lines of oh you're going to go um what you're doing sounds a lot more interesting than what you're doing now like you're going to go find a more interesting job right something that you something that's going to make you a little, a little bit more motivated is going to get you out of bed is going to allow you I don't know, just a more, it's just a more interesting job, right? That's what they kind of said. Now, I kind of didn't say anything at the time, but I kind of thought about it a lot when I was going home, and I thought, does an interesting job even exist? Does the idea of having an interesting job, isn't that a bit of an oxymoron? Interesting job, right? For the most part, most of us work jobs because we have to, right? We, have, we work a job in order to kind of keep a roof over our heads, keep us fed, and to kind of, you know, um, ward off any kind of hungry wolves that are going to try and kind of, you know, take our food off our plate or kill our babies and shit, right? But we also do work in, in order to kind of enjoy the luxuries of life, whether it be going to music festivals, going away on a holiday, buying ourselves um, new clothes or buying a new car, or whatever it may be, right? We kind of work. We don't mind exchanging our time for money because we value the things that we're going to get from the money more than we value our time. For the most part, that's the kind of uh, agreement that we're kind of loosely accepting by accepting jobs. Now, but there is a small, or there is a, there is a, there is a sub, not small, there is a subset of people out there that exist who also, who are also fortunate enough to work a job that they find interesting, they find intellectually stimulating, they find very rewarding, that allows them to exchange their time for money, but also allows them to grow as a person. So it, it is quote unquote interesting to them. But I think for the, by and large, I'd say for the most part, not all of us have that kind of, not all of us are fortunate enough to be in that position. So it kind of got me thinking about the whole as aspect, idea of interesting job. And it kind of made me think that maybe that's what annoys me about people who work in jobs and then moan a lot, right? Is that they're looking for an interesting job, but the interesting job, they don't, they don't know what the interesting job they're looking for is. They just want to fall into it. They have no... Um, idea how to kind of find a job that's going to interest them because they don't generally have any interest. Maybe that might be part of it. 
or that they that they're putting too much onus, too much emphasis. They're putting all their hopes and dreams into finding an interesting job in order to kind of make their life fulfilling. And I think that's where the disconnect comes with it. Because for me personally, I get a lot of my self worth, a lot of my um, a lot of my happiness comes from outside of work. I use work as an opportunity for me to gain new skills, m- make new friends, um, explore new industries, whatever it may be, right? But I get a lot of my satisfaction with life outside of work completely. I'm somebody who's very, very militant when it comes to the idea of work time and home time. I don't let them merge. I don't let them mix whatsoever, right? If I finish at five on a Friday, um, and you have something very important to tell me that I need to kind of look over for the weekend, it can wait until Monday. I'm not going to check it over the weekend. I refuse. I don't check any emails after six. I don't check any emails over the weekend. That's it. Like That's my free time, my free time, which then allows me to get the maximum amount of value for my job nine to five because I'm able to give myself completely to the role. I'm not, I'm not kind of half in, half out. I'm not, uh, I'm not kind of like, um, I'm not kind of halfway, interested i'm fully invested into the idea of trying to give my best and my all into a job now sometimes it can fluctuate sometimes you can go through periods where you're not interested and you feel a little bit bummed out and you want to do other things but for the most part i try and give my all to the job that i'm doing in those hours but then i also expect you because you see me doing that to allow me to allow me to kind of have my free time to do my own thing but i don't put all my hopes and dreams into the role itself and i think The lesson to be learned from that throwaway comment is that if you're trying to find an interesting job, I think you're looking at it, you're looking at it the wrong way. I think what you should be trying to do is trying to lead an interesting life overall. Try and find things that interest you and pursue them outside of your workplace so that when you do get to your workplace, you can enjoy it a lot more because you can enjoy it for what it is because all your hopes and dreams aren't wrapped up in the idea of working. That's not the in- most interesting part of your day. The most interesting part of your day is when you get home, is the free time, is the time that you spend with your friends and your family. That's what's actually interesting, not the job that you're doing because for, for some of us, unfortunately, most of our time in in our adulthood is wrapped up around work right you're working 40 hours a week eight hours a day most of your time is spent at work but if we can it's very hard to do but if you can somehow make your outside life interesting so that even if you're only spending four hours even if you only have four hours of free time a day or six hours whatever it may be those are the most interesting parts of your day that can then lead you to live in a more interesting life and being a better inter- and being a better employee for the companies that you work for but i just don't believe in the, in this whole idea of finding an interesting role an interesting job because that novelty wears off very very quickly even if it's something that you've dreamed about doing it's especially if you go into it with that sort of mindset very quickly you'll realize that it's just a job at the end of the day it doesn't matter if you work for apple tesla um, amazon uber whatever it may be but sooner or later, if you have that if you have that mindset, you will sooner or later realize that a job is just a job. But if you go into it with other interests outside their work, I, I guarantee you that job will be a lot more worthwhile, a lot more gratifying to you overall. And you'll, it, you'll then in turn be a much better employee and colleague to work alongside. That's just my own point of view on the matter. Um, next up on the list that I thought was interesting are these needless and van slip-ons, which I thought looked fucking incredible. Um... So, uh, needleless has been needless has been in the um, has been in the public eye for a while now. Um, mostly due to the track pants that everyone kind of wears. That I've been selling out. You know, every time they come online on their website, I, I always double check because I always want to get a pair. I'm hope I hope we try and get a pair maybe end of the month. But I've been trying to get a pair maybe for the last two years or so. Um, they're quite they're they're quite fairly priced on their online store. I think they're about one eighty or maybe two hundred. But then when they get on resale, they go for crazy amounts. Um, the the org, the kind of ASAP Rocky crew ones, they go for like maybe three to four hundred on stock. As I've seen them go for really high amounts too. They were, they were really nice colorways. But overall, those track pants have been the reason why this brand kind of skyrocketed. If you're if you're getting really nitty picky with it, you might say that before the track pants came the the reconstructed flannels that a lot of the guys in that kind of ASAP Rocky crew are wearing, right? So they were very popular too. That kind of got people's interest in it. But I think by and large, by the general public, I think the track pants are what really have catapulted the brand. But they always do very interesting collaborations when it comes to vans and other stuff. They always take interesting approaches. And this slip on that they've made at the moment now and needless and vans are very interesting too. I love the look of them. So it's sort of like a crushed velvet upper on a vans, kind of of classic van slip on. Crushed velvet upper with a solid black 
kind of um, sole. So the fox in, there's no fox in, no stripe, the solid black sole and a kind of tassel on the top of the loaf. So it kind of looks like a, a, a tasseled loafer, but with crushed velvet on a kind of van shoe. So immediately, um, very, very striking, something that I like the look of, something that, again is outside of the norm of collaboration in terms of just changing the colorway. Maybe this is kind of a residue effect of the kind of Virgil Abloh influence when he did with the whole Nike and Nike 10 collection where he took um, the staple shoes and kind of deconstructed them and put them back together again. So like fucked around the proportions, fucked around the materials, turned stuff inside out, outside in is kind of um, a little bit of a departure from the traditional way collaborations were done where you just change the color change the colorway on the standard shoe think of a tiffany dunk for instance right it's just a dunk but the colorway was changed or you know different sort of materials were used that's sort of like a an era of streetwear or an era of sneaker culture that existed at that time but now we're kind of moving forward we're moving into this new kind of um area where fear of god nike collaborations are completely new shoe um, for instance, the, the Elix collaboration that I've seen, an image of the Air Force One, they've changed the strap and made it into a belt and maybe changed some material proportions of finishing. You've got the Cold War Air Force One mid where they kind of removed the um, amount of eyelets that took away some of the paneling. Um, they put a different strap, like loads of kind of changing the actual elements of the shoe. Right, you're seeing that with the Kendrick Lamar quarter that's going to come out soon with the kind of pull tab at the bottom, uh, at the back of it, so you don't have any laces. So I, I like the approach that they're doing that at the moment. And these these van slip-ons look fucking incredible. They look really, really nice. Um, judging by the Hypebeast article, they're due to come out on the 13th. So they've already, they've already been out, I think, at the moment now at various <coughs> Japanese retailers. I'm sure they're going to sell out straight away. But they look amazing. So on the screen now, I've got, I think, purple crushed velvet, you're going to say, right? I'll say purple crushed velvet at the moment. Um, and there's different colorways too to check here on the on the Instagram page. So they've got a sort of yellow, crushed velvet, which looks amazing. Again, like the tassel loaf in the front look just looks so so cool. And the gum, the kind of like the traditional waffle gum saw on the bottom looks really nice too. So it comes in that gold sort of colorway, purple, a black, a black, a block, a black sort of like velvet or suede. Is that crushed actually? Looking back on the picture. I think it might not be crushed. Maybe it's just a general velvet or suede. What does it say here? Plush velvet uppers uh, with acetate with gold bit, gold detailing. Yeah. So it's crushed velvet, but the black looks a little bit less crushed and more to just general velvet. So it comes in black. It comes in purple. Yeah. So you've got black, purple, and kind of like a goldy kind of colorway. And again, so coming up to October 13th, I don't recommend you check those out. They're in the same vein as the... Um, have you seen the Noah and the Vans collaboration too? They, they look fucking cool as shit as well no there's some really good collaborations too so it's sort of like a vans chucker but with like a sh one strap going over the front of it. it looks really 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 nice let me check out and see last time i checked they were completely sold out and then they have them available in really small sizes but they were priced amazingly as well Noah, Noah priced their collaborations really really well that's something that's kind of underrated when it comes to brands overall or something that's underappreciated with some of the bigger brands you know they, their pricing is really advantageous to kids that want to kind of get involved in wear sneakers or wear street related stuff so for instance if you can see on the screen now this vans and noah uh chucker ms is 98 dollars, right so it's completely sold out there's only available in the size 5.5 if you're looking for them but Again, it's taking a traditional Vans chucker shape and kind of like fucking around with it. So adding a strap on it instead of the laces it look, and embossed kind of like um, Noah cross logo on the back. It looks amazing. Again, I fucking love it. Wish there was more size available. Maybe it might come. Maybe they might be available later down the line in terms of other retailers like Dover Street Market might be available. But yeah, these are incredible, incredible shoes at the moment. Vans are doing some really cool stuff with people at the moment. I, I wasn't a fan of their kind of like copycat off-white skate high deconstructed thing they did recently but i think collaboration wise i think they, they do a really good job of allowing brands to kind of come in and really um you know stamp their mark on a shoe and really do their own thing i think that's something that's kind of goes without saying with a lot of brands they don't tend to do that and just to kind of give a brand a silhouette and tell them look run free on that but don't do anything else which is kind of can get kind of annoying but i like how vans do it anyway what's next on the docket here oh fire festival founder sentenced to six year in prison yeah i'm sure you guys are familiar with it uh the story that came out a few is it a couple of years ago now the whole fire festival thing where uh a lot of kind of celebrities such as ja rule were betting on this company or betting on this festival that was kind of expanding it was a kind of trend that was happening a few years ago which is kind of carried on now where a lot of the young people a lot of millennials quote unquote were um 
were sacrificing material possessions for experiences, right? The whole experience economy was popping off. People were going on fe- going to festivals, going to retreats, going to hideaways and stuff. And, and a company came along that wanted to kind of be the competitor to Coachella and sort of offer a Coachella that was took place on an island somewhere far, far, far away. So the whole idea behind it was a kind of, you know, a, a, a kind of glossier version of uh, a burning man where people will be able to go to a far destination and kind of disconnect completely from the outside world and kind of take part into this whole social media led run uh, fire festival um, quickly um, during the kind of process of the festival kind of kicking off it kind of came to light that this festival wasn't what it said it was going to be and that it kind of saw people a dud um, the festival never really popped off loads of things happened in between that kind of led to it kind of failing and um loads of videos kind of popped up on social media about people being stranded on the island not being given food or shelter loads of really in um really fucked up shit happened and unfortunately the founder of the festival ended up uh getting in big trouble and being jailed now finally for six years for fraud which is you know some heavy consequence that led to the whole story there's an article that happened recently that kind of detailed a lot of the things that happened on bbc that i'm going to read out to you guys now i'll link it again in the show notes but what a what a fall from grace man imagine going from having this amazing idea of, of doing this festival all the way to ending up in prison like it's just crazy but anyway the first this is an article from the bbc news i'll read here uh, fire festival founder billy mcfarland jail for six years um, Billy McFarlane, 26, pleaded guilty to fraud early this year. A judge on Thursday described him as a serial fraudster who had been dishonest for most of his life. Party girls were promised a luxury event in the Bahamas, but instead was stranded on an island without enough food, water, or accommodation. The event in April 2017 was eventually cancelled and hundreds of people evacuated. Tickets had cost between 1200 and 100000 Jesus Christ. So that was a top, top tier um, ticket to the kind of the general public ones fucking nuts in it um today mcfarlane quote today mcfarlane found out the hard way that empty promises don't lead to jet setting champagne and extravagant parties that lead to federal prison said the u.s attorney in manhattan addressing the court on thursday mcfarlane said he knew he had betrayed the trust of my investors my customers and my family he said the sentencing was an extremely bitter reality mcfarlane pleaded guilty in march to two counts of wire fraud related to the festival but then in july admitted to two more counts of fraud relating to another ticket selling scam that he had set up while on bail jesus christ so while on bail he set up another fraud. I'm assuming he set up that fraud to kind of support his legal costs, I'm assuming, right? Because the money was running out. But God almighty, man. Chill out with the fraud, dude. Um, in October, prosecutors requested that McFarland serve between 11 and 14 years in prison, describing him as a consummate con artist. Sentencing on Thursday, Judge Naomi Nice um, Buckwild said McFarland was unique in, his, in this court's memory. The defendant is a serial fraudster, and to date his fraud, like, like a circle, has no end. She told the court in Manhattan, McFarland has been dishonest for most of his life. The Fire Festival was built as a cultural moment created from a blend of music, art, and food in the Bahamas. T- tickets included a flight from Miami, a stay in a geoci- geocidic dome, and activities including yoga and kayaking. So again, taking the whole experience um, ethos that people... That like young people were more willing to part with their money in order to have a once in a lifetime experience that they could sort of share on social media in the in the hopes of creating FOMO for people that weren't there. They kind of really, really tapped into it um, on paper, but then didn't deliver with an actual physical event. Um, tickets included a flight from Miami, a stay in the uh, Geosco Dome and activities. It had initially been advertised with an Instagram video featuring famous models sailing on a luxury yacht and top musician acts such as Blick 182 on a bill. Um, top musicians blink 182 mm. uh, but festival goers posted videos and uh, photos of online of a mass chaos and a complete disaster this is a video um that someone posted on twitter back in the day right is it gonna play Let's see if it plays here uh, na, 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 na. absolutely mad i remember seeing these videos pop up on social you remember seeing that box that someone posted of a the styrofoam box with like some bread and cheese and a bit of lettuce on it and that was a quote-unquote food um they they were gonna give their patrons like it was absolutely insane um they had like tents i think with them sort of like medical tents right you get in relief areas something that someone said i think when when they saw the tents pop up so there's a video now i'm playing of just like random festival goes standing around i think any festival that you go to and you see loads of people just standing around you know for sure the organization's been fucked up just standing around and billy mcfarland i think is talking to them and trying to get them to chill out but it, just, it, lo- it looks like a disaster zone. You know, the aftermath of a hurricane. That's what it basically, basically looks like, um, which is sad as well, considering the, the kids that were going there were expecting. Because it's not as if, like, he was trying to set up a festival where 
you go and you kind of like you know you do your like a kind of uh, a burning man where it's sort of like you weed out all the kind of like um pretenders because it's very expensive to go to you have to do a lot of planning before you go it requires a lot of cooperation between different different people and strangers and shit so you weed out a lot of the pretenders but this this um event the fire festival it kind of welcomed all and everyone um under the sun because because under the premise that they were going to provide this kind of like front and back service for you, right? They were going to pick you up from a, a, an airport in Florida. They were going to take you to the Bahamas. They were going to put you up in these amazing tents. You didn't have to bring your own camping equipment. They were going to give you food. There was going to be food available. There. Everything kind of like um, invited people that were not going to... It, it kind of welcomed people who weren't necessarily um, ready to go to an event that was half done. They weren't expecting that. They were expecting to go to an event that was very shiny, very well done, loads of corporate sponsorship all over the place. And you get there and you're all stranded in the middle of Bahamas um, with a backdrop of palm trees kind of swaying in the wind. It must have been in nuts. The rapper Ja Rule, who was originally described as a co organizer for the event, was not arrested or charged um, with connection with the fraud, which is very fortunate for him. His lawyers have since argued that McFarlane used the artist's name in connection to promote the event. So um, they kind of argued that Ja Rule had no uh, idea about what kind of fraud this guy was committing. But yeah, imagine, man, what a, what a bitter reality. And like, he, like he mentions in the, in the article, it was a, I guess it was a bitter reality to kind of come to the, the, the one end to the whole story, right? He kind of tried to, I'm assuming what he probably tried to do was sell loads of, he tried to, he sold all these empty promises to investors and what, all that malarkey, right, to get the money. And then he hoped that he could kind of like make the money back on a back end in order to pay them back so that the lies that he'd made in the front or the beginning wouldn't matter. But unfortunately, he made so many lies that he couldn't necessarily keep up with them you couldn't necessarily fulfill or um, make good on his promises which then inevitably led to people chasing after him and the moment you people see people chase after you for your money there's only one way it ends and unfortunately it's prison time so he's got six years in prison i'm assuming he won't do the full six he'll probably come out in four um i'm assuming there'll be an, a film based on this or a documentary that'll be uh, illuminating very interesting to see a kind of maybe a, a higher production level version of like um tanacon documentary um that a few that like someone that like shane dawson did which was really really good where he kind of um pulled back the curtain on the whole tanacon tana monte or whatever the name is tana on youtube who tried to do uh an, an event or a convention that was in direct um competition with with vidcon who uh who were unwilling to kind of invite tana to the event or give her any kind of speaking fees when it came to the event overall. So she kind of, you know, in a kind of fit of rage, kind of set up this whole event very off the cuff, very off the hip. But then slowly but surely over the course of time of organizing a big convention, she suddenly realized that these events, you don't just, inv you don't just, you don't just organize a festival or an event like this on the back, you know what I mean? In your head and think it's going to just work out. You're not promoting a club night, right? You have to set up the whole infrastructure for the whole event and it does require a lot of work. It does require a lot of planning. And maybe that's what this fire festival first founder kind of suffered from he kind of thought he could kind of do the event flying off the seat of his pants but more 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 what happened more than likely was that he realized the scale of it he realized the money that he had already um frauded um other investors out of wasn't going to be enough to kind of make the event a success and by, by, by but unfortunately by that time it already kind of went completely out of control and we're in a situation that we're in now and now he's been sentenced to six years in prison imagine six fucking years in prison man absolutely nuts for, for trying to set up a festival that didn't actually work but hey, hey, ho, what can you do? And that is an hour, you know? That is an hour. One full hour of the X News English Show, episode number 114. How amazing was that? Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to see you guys again on Wednesday. Again, I tried to get out free last week, but I only did two. But I'm going to do three this week because sometimes it's hard to do on a Friday because on Friday I work a normal shift. So I'd have to get up like, you know, at 5 a.m. to do a podcast, which might not be the best way to do it. You need to be nice and loose in the brain in order to get the thoughts out nice and succinctly. So I'll try and I'm going to do one on Monday, which is today. Do one on Wednesday and another one again on Thursday. So you get free hot new podcasts throughout the week. So I've got a whole bunch of topics I want to expound on. I want to talk about Kanye West at Trump. But I want to kind of think about what I want to say again, because it's less about the celebrity and more so about the lessons that can be learned from it. I've got topics I want to talk about in terms of Me Too with Julie Chen, um, in terms of how she's supporting her husband and the kind of the, the thing that we don't speak about in public a lot, right? The Me Too movement is amazing and it's kind of it's kind of outed a lot of the creepers that have been uh, sexually abusing women in the industry for years and years. But the thing that no one really speaks about that's very interesting that I want to get um, I want to kind of think about a lot more is the 
unintended consequences or the collateral damage to their family, to their friends, specifically to the women that stand by the side of the sexually accused, sexually accused uh, man in the situation. So in this respect, um, the guy that used to run CBS, his wife, Julie Chen, is has been accused of sexual assault and he stepped down from his position, but she's standing vehemently next to her man and she's not believing, or not, I wouldn't say she's not believing the story, but she's standing next to a man which, which is never to be had led to her having to... Um, having to withdraw from her show called The Talk. And I think they did do a kind of panel discussion talk show. I want to speak about that because it's a very interesting topic about what happened to the woman that stand by as the man that is accused of sexual assault, whether or not the Harvey Weinstein thing, because his wife um, divorced him for the whole sexual assault allegations. But then did, did she divorce him because she wanted to or was it because she wanted to save her public reputation because she has her own fashion brand that has her own name attached to it? And maybe if she attaches, keeps herself attached to Harvey Weinstein, her business will suffer, which would then impact her family. Blah, blah, blah. Loads of really interesting things I want to speak about in that respect that I will talk about in the next episode of the Excellent Zing Show. But for now, this has been the Excellent Zing Show episode number 114. As always, for all listings on DJ stuff that I'm doing, check out excellentzinger.com. All my DJ listings are going to be on there. My blog, you can check it out on there too if you want contact me you can check out on their social stuff on there too please support my sponsor at audible.com for slash aggie to get one free book as with a 30-day free trial audible is a great service over 400,000 titles to choose from um most of the books are narrated by the authors themselves so you can the books really really come to life so i implore you to check that out too and i'll see you again on wednesday for another episode of the excellent show this has been episode number 114 thanks for tuning in peace